Hello again, it's Coach Ikram, and we are on the second video for periodic trends. We are picking up right where we left off with first ionization energy. So ionization energy is, by definition, the energy required to remove the outermost electron from an atom. And it is quantifiable, and we measure it with a unit of kilojoules per mole, which is really going to be important in the future, um, doing stoichiometry, etc. So if you think about it um, in, in reference to the periods, if you're moving across a period, as your atomic number increases, and remember if your atomic number is increasing, your number of protons is increasing, therefore your Z-effective nuclear charge is also increasing, your ionization energy is also going to increase because that nuclear charge is holding those electrons closer. If ionization charge is how much energy it's, is required to take something away, and you've got so many protons in that nucleus that are holding those electrons closer, it's going to take a huge amount of energy to pull an electron away. So as your nuclear charge increases, the electrons are therefore held more closely, and the ionization energy goes up because it requires more energy to remove them. So if you're looking at this, um, on this diagram here, the colors here shown in the key, the darker the color, the higher the ionization energy or the first ionization energy. And it's important to note that the first ionization energy is the energy required to remove that first outermost electron. There actually, there's a specific ionization energy for every single electron that an atom will have. However, we don't tend to look at every single one because the first one is going to give us the most information about that particular atom and its bonding tendencies. So if we look here, um, you can see that the color over here, especially around helium, fluorine, neon, etc., is extremely dark, which should make sense. In that particular period, if we're looking across the period, these atoms over here, they have more protons, therefore a higher Z effective nuclear charge, therefore are holding those electrons closer and aren't going to want to let them go. If you look over here on that same period as fluorine and neon, lithium has a very low Z effective nuclear charge because it doesn't have as many protons in its nucleus and therefore those outermost electrons are more than happy to scamper off. And that's a very crude way of saying that they would go and bond with something else. As you're looking at a group trend and you're moving down a group, as your atomic number increases down the group, your ionization energy is going to decrease. And the main reason for this is shielding. Recall from my last video that shielding is energy levels between your nucleus and that outermost shell. So the more energy levels you add in there, those valence electrons are further and further away from the nucleus. You stick them out further, they're going to be less attracted to that nucleus. They're not going to mind piecing out. So further from the nucleus, more easily removed. So as practice, if we've got sodium and cesium, which one has a higher um, ionization, first ionization energy, um, you, can, you can look on the periodic table. Sodium is going to have less shielding because it has less energy levels than cesium. Therefore, the higher ionization energy, the one that's going to require more, more energy to pull an electron off is going to be sodium than cesium because cesium more shielding, those electrons are further out, they'll be able to be pulled off easier. Which element from the entire periodic table has the highest ionization energy? If you're looking on the periodic table, you want, you effectively, you want the atom with the least amount of shielding, and you want the atom with the highest Z-effective nuclear charge because then it's going to be hardest to take an electron away from it, and that's going to end up being helium. It's got virtually no shielding at all, and because it's in the first energy level, and the Z effective nuclear charge is going to be really, really high because it does not want to lose any of those electrons. Therefore, ionization energy, high. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, if you're looking at this graphically, there are actually going to be two slight dips, so it should make a little bit of sense here. This is your ionization energy over here. It increases as you go to helium, which is a noble gas. You notice your noble gases are up here um, with very, very high 
um, ionization energies, it's hard to take electrons away from them. Then it zips back down here with lithium, goes up to beryllium. There's a slight dip here um, between beryllium and boron, and then again another slight dip on its way up between nitrogen and oxygen, and yet another one here, and a very slight one here. And the reason that that's happening, if you look at the outermost energy level for, say, um, beryllium and boron, beryllium is going to be 2s, this is beryllium, and boron's outer um, energy level is going to be 2s, and then it goes into the 2p, and it's going to have that one electron right there. Okay, that one electron is going to be influenced by the electrons in the 2s um, suborbital, and it's going to be repelled by those, and therefore you're going to see the slight dip where the ionization energy for boron is a little bit less because this electron is a little bit happier to leave that atom. It's a little bit easier to pull it off. And the same thing is effectively going to happen between nitrogen and oxygen, magnesium and aluminum, and phosphorus and sulfur. The second ionization energy, same concept as first ionization energy, except that second ionization energy is that next electron. And if you're looking, um, sorry, um, at this table right here, this is kind of one of those tables, as Mr. Crump would say, you have to let it soak in. Um, but but I, I mean, I kind of look at it, you kind of see the staircase right here. If you look at, say, lithium, for example, look at a periodic table when you're looking at this. That's going to make this so much easier. If you look at a periodic table, okay, lithium has that one valence electron. It has limited shielding, and it doesn't, um, and doesn't have a lot of... Um, uh, Z effective nuclear charge. Therefore, it's pretty easy to take an electron away from lithium. In fact, lithium kind of wants you to do that because then it becomes an ion and it's and it's got its full valence electron shell. So that first ionization energy is fairly low. It's not hard to take that electron away. But the minute you take it away, that second ionization energy is so much higher because it doesn't want to lose that second electron because it's happy once it loses the first one. Same with beryllium. Beryllium's got two valence electrons, so removing the first and the second isn't that much of a big deal because it doesn't have a huge Z effect of nuclear charge. It's not holding them very closely, but then once you lose those two, it doesn't want to lose anymore, and therefore that third ionization energy becomes ridiculously high. And the trend follows down, and you'll notice the staircase sort of follows how many valence electrons it has and how many it's willing to lose before it doesn't want to lose anymore. Um, and that's putting it very crudely, but if that makes more sense to you, um, hopefully that'll kind of let it sink in a little bit more. So removing a core electron, something that is not one of your valence electrons, is going to require so much more energy than removing one of your valence electrons. Electronegativity. Electronegativity is the measure of an atom's ability to take another's atom's electrons. I don't really love that term. Um, I'm going to change this, and I'm going to make it an atom's pull on another atom's electrons. Okay? It is abbreviated EN in the rest of this uh, PowerPoint presentation, and we don't use units for electronegativity. Um, there are two there are two values for electronegativity, numeric values that we put to it. And if you're looking at this diagram that we have down here at the bottom, um, you'll see that we have our electronegativity values in place in the periodic table. Um, and electronegativity, if you've got two atoms that are that are, for example, bonded together, and so I'm going to do a covalent example here. We've got hydrogen and fluorine. If I bond hydrogen and fluorine together. Okay, fluorine has a very high electronegativity on this, on this table of electronegativity values, 3.98. That's because fluorine has so many uh, protons in its, in its nucleus that it's got a very, very high Z effective nuclear charge. So when this fluorine is bonded with this hydrogen, that Z effective nuclear charge isn't just affecting the fluorine. It is so strong, it's also going to affect the electrons around the hydrogen. So these two electrons that are right in here in this bond that they're sharing, fluorine's going to have such a high pull on those, and it's going to be pulling those electrons closer to the fluorine nucleus because of that Z-effective nuclear charge, whereas hydrogen has, you know, virtually no Z-effective nuclear, not no, but it doesn't have as much Z-effective nuclear charge. Therefore, it's willing to let fluorine pull those electrons a little bit further away. 
And the same is going to be true for any of these nonmetals over here. You'll find that nonmetals will generally have a higher um, electronegativity value because they have a higher Z effective nuclear charge. Therefore, they want to pull those electrons closer. So when they're bonded with, say, a nonmetal from over here, which have a low Z effective nuclear charge, the nonmetals are going to have a higher, higher pull. So if you look at it numerically, going back to that, we put this value, it's a rough estimate value, but electronegativity difference, if you were to subtract these two values, if the electronegativity difference in that bond is greater than 1.7, it's ionic bonding, which would mean you have a metal and a nonmetal. In the case of my hydrofluoric acid here, it's going to be greater than 1.7. If you have an electronegativity difference of less than 1.7, that's going to indicate a molecular or covalent bond. So that would be if you have bonded any of your nonmetals together, their electronegativity values are a little bit closer. They're both going to have very strong pulls on those electrons. Therefore, it's going to be a little bit, their electronegativity values are going to be a little bit closer together, hence the less than 1.7. Eh, sorry. Okay. So periodic trend, if you're going across the row of a period, as your atomic number increases, your electronegativity is also going to increase. This is because, like I said before, if you increase your nuclear charge and your Z effective nuclear charge, it's going to have, in a bond, more pull on its electrons and the bonded electrons than another atom is going to. So if you practice, if you've got beryllium and you've got oxygen, which one has a higher electronegativity? If you're going to look at a periodic table, oxygen has more protons in its nucleus, therefore a higher Z effective nuclear charge, therefore it's going to have a higher pull on electrons when it's in a bond than beryllium is going to. If you're looking down a group, as your atomic number increases, your electronegativity is going to decrease. The main reason for this is shielding, okay? As you, if electronegativity is how much pull it's going to have, the more um, um, layers of, of energy level you're going to have there, the less, the less pull and less attraction that nucleus is going to have on electrons that it's bonded with. So the electrons at the top of a group have their electrons really closely held because they're closer. But as you move down the group, you've got more shielding, more energy levels between your valence electrons and your nucleus. Therefore, they're further away, and when they're reacting, they're not, there's not going to be as much pull towards that, towards that nucleus. So again, if you're looking at this kind of big picture, your nonmetals over here are going to have higher electronegativity because... In a bond, this Z effective nuclear charge is going to be affecting the electrons of what it's bonded with, and it's going to be pulling them closer. This is all because of the number of protons and the higher the atomic number. If you look over here with our nonmetals, or sorry, our metals over here, they have less Z effective nuclear charge, therefore the pull on those electrons is going to be less. And it is also important to note that these three right here, um, these noble gases, they are blacked out. They don't have an electronegativity value because they're got a full, they've got a full valence electron shell and they don't have any need to bond with anything else. And they also don't have any electrons in a D um, um, orbital yet. They're not at that, they're not at that point on the periodic table, so they're not going to react. Krypton and xenon we'll talk about later, but they actually will have some electronegativ electronegativity trend um, and will have some pull on the electrons. Um, so some other things of note. Reactivity refers to how likely an atom is to react with other substances. This is going to be dependent on the two things that we've just talked about. Ionization energy, which is how easily can it be removed, and then electronegativity, which is not so much how easily atoms can grab electrons, but how strong the attra attraction is in a bond. Metals have a very low ionization energy. Remember, it's not too difficult to pull an electron away. As you move across a period and your atomic number increases, the reactivity of a metal is going to decrease. As you move down um, and your atomic number increases, your reactivity is going to also increase. So, for example, in the alkali metals, cesium, francium, rubidium, all those at the bottom of that group, because they have higher 
they have higher atomic numbers, they're going to be much more reactive than, say, lithium, sodium, and potassium are at the top of that group of alkali metals. And why? If the ion energy is low, an atom is more likely to lose an electron. And if it's more likely to lose an electron, then that means you're undergoing a chemical reaction, hence reactivity. Nonmetals have a very high electronegativity. And again, if you're looking at it from period and group perspective, in a period, as your atomic number increases, your reactivity is also going to increase. And then as you're looking at it from a group perspective and you're looking down one particular group, as an atomic number increases, your reactivity will decrease. And the why behind this is if your electronegativity is high, the atom is going to take or pull electrons from other atoms more easily. And the more it pulls those electrons towards it, the more it's going to result in a chemical reaction. And so if you're looking at, at, at big picture, okay, reactivity, these nonmetals up here are going to be more reactive um, because of, of the electronegativity and the ionization energy. And these down here, my metals, are going to be more reactive because, again, from the last few slides, as you move down a group, um, their reactivity is going to increase for metals. For nonmetals, as you move down a group, the reactivity decreases. Therefore, these are going to be the most reactive. Metallic character is another trend, and you don't need to, you know, there's only one slide on it. You don't need to know a huge amount about it. But as you look at a periodic table on the whole, the most metallic um, elements are going to be down here and on the left. And the least metallic should make a little bit of sense. These are your non-metals up here in the right-hand corner. And so metallic character is going to increase following this trend right here. And that should make sense based on the last two slides and what we talked about with ionization energy and electronegativity. Density, another trend that's kind of just one of those, it's odd, it's, but it's good to know. Um, across a period, if you're looking at it in a period, it peaks in the middle of these D and F blocks. You kind of notice this slight peak here in the middle, and then it kind of tapers off, which is really interesting. Um, and then it's also going to, as you move down a group, density is also going to increase, so the most dense um, Elements are going to be at the bottom of each individual family or group. Melting point. Across a period, melting point will also peak in the middle of the DNF blocks right here in the middle. You can see it peaking. Um, and this is really good for application. This, you know, you won't use this day in and day out, but it's really good to understand the melting points of certain metals that you'll actually see um, in the real world and things that you can apply melting point to. As you look down a group, however, though, melting point has no trend. Boiling point, um, same concept. It's going to peak in the middle of D and F, um, but in down a group, it's also going to have no appreciable trend. And again, this is all important for application. And that is all I've got for you. Hopefully that made sense. Again, like I said in the last video, rewatch the video. Have your periodic table out while you're watching the video so that you can, you can see it. Because all of this makes a lot more sense when you can visualize it. Write down good notes, write down good questions, and we'll see you in class. Thanks.